We're back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us this Thursday live. We're on Facebook at newschannel5.com and on the plus 737-7587. Our guest with us this morning, Professor Thomas Schwartz from over at Vanderbilt. Good to have the professor with us this morning. And uh, Professor, a question for you. On election night, I found a little, I was trying to get a handle on it and maybe I missed the explanation. At one point, you know, uh, in the evening, the president declared that he had won and was calling for the votes to stop. And I was like, okay, well, I mean, maybe he thinks he's won and whatever. But at that point, he was not even close to 270 electoral votes at that point. So I, I don't understand the logic between calling for the votes to stop at that point or, you know, the counting to stop. Did you get a handle on why he said it that way? I, I basically thought that's just Donald Trump. Um, he says things like that. He um, he was ahead in some states by that point that looked like they would yield an electoral majority. And so um, his inclination, um, his belief in himself, um, his, as one of the callers put it, his narcissism, I mean, he basically thought he had won or, or thinks he's won and, and declared it. Uh, that is classic Trump. Okay, yeah. Um, and, Fair. you know, that, that's what we're we're used to. Sure, and that's his right to do it. It's just I was thinking, okay, I mean, he may say that, and he may certainly believe it, but, you know, it, he has to get to 270, mm -hmm. and he wasn't even close at that point. And if you stop vote, counting right. the votes at that point, well, you know, it made no sense. All right, let's go next to uh, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Michael. Hi, Michael. Good morning, Nick. Hey. I don't have a dog in this fight. Guess okay. what? All right. Surprisingly. I, I give up on it. Here's, here's one of the problems I see. During the impeachment, you heard congressmen lie. You heard senators <clears> lie. <throat> During uh, the election, you heard Trump lie after lie. You heard Biden, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. When he said before, that's exactly what he was going to do. He lied. The American people can no longer trust a government that continues to lie to you. The media, a lot of the media, don't report on things. And you can see it. No, they don't think we see this. We know what's happening. Why lie to us? We've been lied to so much that it's hard to believe that we've got record number of mail-in ballots. I see the coronavirus. I understand that we could have record mail-in ballots. That you know, mm -hmm. but you see records of them. But who are we to believe? Biden, Trump? No, <laughs> they both lie. A liar is a liar is a liar. All right. I mean, I know that obviously trust, be it in a candidate or the media or or whoever is a, an issue right now and and knowing that what you're getting is fair and accurate is is not always the easiest thing to do uh, yes <laughs> i gather uh the caller put his uh, finger on the great deal of mistrust that exists uh on both sides of the political spectrum the the tendency to believe that your side uh is telling the truth the other is lying uh but an unwillingness sometimes to critique your own side and to, to recognize um what what the problems are that's happening partisanship uh, the great uh, British essayist Christopher Hitchens once wrote that partisanship makes us stupid. And there are ways in which being excessively partisan really blinds us sometimes to the, to the faults on each side and, and particularly to the degree to which politicians on both sides exaggerate or lie. There are differences. So, and I think that has to be called into mind. There are differences in the scale of the lies that various politicians uh, tell, and that has to be uh, acknowledged at times too. Yeah, everyone has to kind of decide on their own, in their own mind, what they find. And you have to, you know, put that through your filter of partisanship one way or the other. You mm -hmm. know, as it's, uh, Joe makes a good point here. He goes, everyone's a narcissist, I think, with regard to politicians. And, and he's true to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've covered little local races, you know, I mean, and what goes on yeah. with, a, you know, just a, a council race or something like that in a small town and see what those. Can you imagine what kind of ego and mindset you have to have to be on this national stage that Trump and Biden are on right now. It's, it, it's befuddling. Mm -hmm. It's completely out of the realm, and, and, and I think Joe's right. Um, let's see. We've got Taylor on one. Taylor, good morning. Hi, Taylor. Good morning, Nick. Hey. Good morning to the professor. Um, well, it's a different day, a different uh, set of uh, going zones than from the last time I talked with you. Uh, my candidate has obviously lost this election, which I'm sorry about, but uh, I'm uh, not pulling my hair out or smacking my neighbor or anything like that over it. I think as far as this recount is concerned, uh, to be honest, 
There are a couple of cities, Philadelphia being one. I would not put anything past what uh, some of these uh, uh, groups would do to throw an election, but that's one or two cities uh, out of all these that are in contention. So uh, I, th I think the president uh, uh, is barking up the wrong tree on, um, especially at this point, uh, as to anything. We we need to um, uh, accept what the people have said. It's it's over four million people. Popular vote um, difference. And, of course, just like with Hillary, a huge majority of that overvote comes from states like California, New York, New Jersey, some of That's the uh, heavier states like that. And in those states, their candidate wins by even larger percentages than what the percentages are in, in like in Tennessee, it was maybe 61 percent for um, Trump here. In California, I bet you it'll turn out to be 75 or 80 percent, uh, which a population like that just really. Uh, no, you're right. You're right about that. I think it was even higher in Tennessee, but you make a great point. And we talked earlier, Taylor, about how if it was a popular vote, there would be different strategies. And it is interesting to hearing from Taylor. He's a regular uh, caller to this show, someone I have a lot of respect for. And he's been a strong supporter of the president. Um, and it's just, I wonder, as, as a Trump supporter right now, I want to tell him that, yeah, in his mind, he thinks it may be over. It is not at this point. Um, would you agree at this point, Professor, that there are few fewer paths for the sitting president right now to win than for Joe Biden as it stands right now. But it still is. It's not over. But I hear what Taylor's saying. And as always, Taylor's classy and gracious. Uh, I don't think with whichever side loses, we're going to see a lot of graciousness, unfortunately. But go ahead. Yeah, no, I think the, uh, uh, the path to victory for Trump is very narrow now. Um, he would need, for example, um, uh, he obviously needs he, he needs to win all of the contested states um and that also would include uh or the, or the four contested states of pennsylvania georgia north carolina and nevada if he's going to win right now now this this means that arizona which uh some still put in the undecided but the ap called for uh biden um uh, also uh stays for biden he would need to read, win all four of those states. So it's it's a very narrow path for the president right now. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering, uh, again, what will hinge on it are the votes coming in from mail-in or absentee. And I'm yes. just wondering, uh, would the president be asking for, you know, these not to be counted if he thought they were voting for him, and vice versa? Would Biden be saying, let's vote them if he thought they were coming back, not for him. I mean, I just think you can flip it back and forth, but would you agree that the sentiment is most of the, not most, but many of the mail-in ballots are going to probably be more Democrat than Republican? And if so, why, Professor? Well, it does seem, I mean, this is a, you already mentioned that the, the virus got politicized very early, and so Democrats who took it more seriously um, did apply for mail-in ballots. At least that's what the surveys tend to show us. And so that they were more likely, and, and so far that has seemed to be the case in the uh, states where they have done some counting with mail-in ballots. Uh, this, is, it, it, this is an unprecedented election. The, the pandemic has changed the pattern of voting um, in the United States quite decisively. And so I'm, uh, this is not a surprise that we have, uh, you know, the, for, for the first time, a state like Pennsylvania dealing with enormous numbers of mail-in ballots. So yeah. that's part of this, the situation is the unprecedented character of, the, uh, of this particular issue. Yeah, and one big block they're waiting for in Pennsylvania is out of the county where the city of Pittsburgh is, which they expect will likely mm -hmm. be fairly strongly Democrat. But again, my belief is, you know, if there is fraud and it can be found, I want to see the evidence of it. But short of that, if you're Joe Biden and you think the mail-in votes are going to help you, you're for it. If you're Donald Trump and you think the mail-in votes are not going to hurt you, you're against it. And you can flip it either way. And apparently, you know, that's politicians for you. But that doesn't mean anything unless there's true evidence. And right now, there is no evidence of fraud. None. A lot of people say, oh, well, look at that. We'll see. It's going to come out. And you can bet it's going to be scrutinized. But right now, there simply is not widespread evidence of any mail-in fraud. And there never has been in U.S. history. Let's go uh, to Kathy next. Kathy, good morning. Hi, Kathy. 
Hello. Hey, what's on your mind? Um, I wanted to know more about the elect electric college vote, these votes that they're trying to get now. When they actually pass those, do they have to go with what their state voted? Huh, interesting. Okay, yeah, let's let the professor kind of explain the way that works. Uh, the state of Tennessee, for instance, went very, very heavily, obviously, for Trump. And so the delegates will go, and all of Tennessee's delegates are going to be expected to vote for Trump. Could one go rogue and throw his or her vote toward Biden at the convention? Uh, yes, uh, that can happen in some states. Uh, there's this thing called a faithless elector. Um, it happened in uh, the 2016. A number of electors uh, for Hillary Clinton or for, and, and a couple for Trump voted differently. Uh, electors are selected by the parties in their state, and sometimes, especially in 2016, uh, there were some Republicans who uh, could not stomach Trump and didn't want to vote as they, when they went. Now, there was a Supreme Court case on that quite recently that allowed states to restrict um, electors to voting for who their state had, had voted for. And states can pass various restrictions. But that is a state-by-state -state thing. And so we have had, the Electoral College has uh, sometimes yielded faithless electors, never to the point where it really counted or, or, or prevented things. But if we have a 270 to 269 election, you're, or 268 electoral votes, you may have some people uh, shouting about that this time around. I don't think it would happen, but that has happened. We have had a couple of electors in the past do that. Interesting. All right, we'll take a break, come back with our final segment and get the take from the professor on when we think we may have a resolution to this. And by any indication, it's probably not gonna be in the next day or two, but we'll see. Let's take a break and be back with more right after this.